So even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up, live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be, be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream. My four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. One day, down in Alabama, with its vicious racists, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification, one day right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. Good morning, church. 
church, welcome back. I wanted to start this morning by just reading from the Psalms. This is Psalm 46, verses 8 through 11. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations he has brought on the earth, but he makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Amen. All right, Father, we're here for you this morning. Let's worship together. Before the world was made, before you spoke it to be, you were the King of kings. Yeah, you were, yeah, you were. And now you're reigning still, enthroned above all things. Angels and saints cry out, we join them as we sing. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. gave me breath so I could praise your great and matchless name all my days all my days so let my whole life be a blazing offering a life that shouts and sings the greatness of our King glory to God glory to God glory to
give you my soul I live for you alone Every breath that I take Every moment I'm away Lord, have your way in me This next song is an old hymn called I'd Rather Have Jesus. And as I was preparing for uh, singing this weekend and just praying over the song and asking what God would want to speak to me about it, I just felt him share two things with me. The first was Matthew 19 where he talks um, about the rich young man who approached Jesus. And in their conversation, he wanted to know what he was lacking. And Jesus told him to go sell all of his possessions and um, get rid of everything that he held dear and to come follow him. And the word says that he walked away very sad. And so as I was reflecting on that, the second thing that God said to me, I didn't even have to ask him, what I needed, what I was lacking. He just came right out and said that I needed to give him our family's health. And a lot of you know that my son, uh, Wes, he's a senior in high school. He walked through cancer last spring. Um, and more recently, two weeks ago, he was back in the hospital uh, having some breathing issues. And. It's been a really long and bumpy road, and I know so many of you have had such a difficult year. Um, your extended families, work, everything has been very challenging. Um, but Jesus is enough. And when he, Wes was in the hospital room, he was having a procedure done to help him to breathe better. And in the midst of it, he was swarmed by nurses and doctors. And in the midst of it, he just started praising God and telling the nurses and the doctors that he's got this, he's got a purpose, he's gonna redeem this. And he just had so much faith And the 17 year old kid was sharing it in the midst of this chaos. And he's had a really hard year. Yeah, praise God. Um, and one of the doctors said, you know what, kid, you just figured out what takes most of us 50 years to figure out. And uh, so his mom's trying to figure that out as well. Um, so as I sing this next song, I am laying it completely at the feet of Jesus. I would rather have him than even an easier road right now. And that's really hard to say as a mom. But he is everything. And he is going to redeem everything that we've gone through. He's going to redeem everything that you've gone through in your situations. And I'm just going to trust in him and cling to him and claim his throne and his righteousness and praise him. So I'll, I'm going to sing now. And I would love for your help because I'm a little emotional. It's going to be a little shaky. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be His than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hand than to be a king of a vast domain and be held by sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. I'd 
I'd rather have Jesus than man's applause. I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause. I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame. I'd rather be true to his hope. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. I'd rather have Jesus than standing on You're more real than the wind in my lungs Your thoughts define me You're inside me my reality Papa Your thoughts define me You're inside me You're my reality
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning, for this building to come and worship Him freely, and to just be able to come and praise your name. Thank you for Pastor Pat and the message that you put on his heart. Pray that you would speak through him and speak to each and every one of us. You have something for every single one of us here today. And I pray that we would just have open hearts and open ears to receive that this morning. And I pray that all in your name. Amen. I saw a big sign last night in the game that said, Bill, leave. That's a good sign, I thought. But we need to believe too, don't we? 25 years in the making, I think we're headed to the Super Bowl. What do you think? I, I think we are. And, uh, and I, I think it's exciting, and it's exciting for our town. You know, as we get into the scriptures today, uh, you can turn to John chapter 3, but I just want to talk to us about a couple things real quick. Uh, as we have this volunteer weekend, next weekend, the training that we're going to be doing, uh, one of the things that's needed for that is uh, we are trying to provide child care for families that want to come and they need that. It's for little babies up to about uh, grade 5. Ms. Dawn and her team are preparing all the tools that are necessary, but we need some people that might be willing to come and watch those kids during that time. Be from about 8.30 till about 12.15. Uh, we'll be done. Uh, so maybe you're not serving in some capacity, but this is something that you could do or be interested in doing. And if so, I just encourage you to get a hold of Miss Donna uh, like today or tomorrow so that we, we know that we have that covered. Um, we had some folks lined up, but that uh, didn't work out now. So we, we're just looking for that kind of help. And if you could do that, we greatly appreciate that. I do want to encourage us to be here for the Commitment Weekend. It's going to be an exciting morning of hearing what God has done and what God's going to do. Uh, I've been touched deeply by the life of a guy by the name of George Mueller. And one of the things about his life that touched me is just simply this. He began every day by just putting his soul at peace with the Lord and allowing everything else to flow out of that. He chronicled over 50,000 prayers that he offered during his lifetime, and what he found was God answered them, and 30,000 of them were answered within an hour to the day, or within the day. The other ones took a little bit longer, and it was through difficulty sometimes. But God was faithful to answer prayer. So that's what Andrea was talking about when we think about the RISE service and everything we're doing that weekend. So I encourage you to be here. It's going to be lifting up Jesus Christ. Also, next weekend, something that's uh, been on my heart as, as we've been walking alongside him, uh, I know that Pastor Enosh has touched many of our lives here. Uh, he has been such a joy to have among us from last June till now. Uh, he was working towards getting uh, a, a visa where he could work here, and that hasn't quite happened yet. He's through part of that process, but he's going to be headed home to India January 28th or 29th. And so next weekend, uh, both his parents, by the way, have gone through major surgeries in the last few weeks, and we praise God that those surgeries have been successful and they're doing well. But he's anxious to get home. They're anxious to have him home. Um, but as he leaves us, I want to pray over him next weekend in the services so that we can kind of say goodbye to him. Uh, no, it's not goodbye. It's till we see you later, uh, because we look forward to having him back among us at some point. Uh, but I, I want you to be here for that as we, as we honor this man of God who has touched us deeply. That'll be next weekend in the services as well. Well, if you missed it, I encourage you to go to the video that will be posted later today and watch the countdown that was created for right before the service. It was a countdown leading into our service today. 
It was a video of Dr. Martin Luther King, and tomorrow we'll remember his work and celebrate it as a national holiday. We remember his legacy and that work, and and as we have expressed and demonstrated through the years as a congregation, we stand with the sentiments and truth espoused by Dr. King's dream, a world without racial prejudice and strife, where children of all colors and all nations walk hand in hand in freedom. Through peaceful protest and healing words, Dr. King spoke of coming together, not paying back evil with evil in the face of adversity and injustice. In essence, the truths of the gospel were at the core of that movement. But I find it's not that way today. What I find is that there are many that are espousing words of hatred and divisiveness accompanied with destruction of lives and properties Those are the tools of many who claim to stand for racial and economic equality and justice today. And the the political rancor that has happened over the last weeks and months and couple years is, is at a level that I've never seen in my lifetime. The cancel culture is is such now that that people are destroying other people. They're stealing and killing and destroying. And people are using their platforms to cancel out the lives and livelihoods of anybody that disagrees with them. It seems that we're not able to have discourse of any level in our culture today. Today is also Sanctity of Life Sunday. Now, as indicated in the Bible, we believe in the sanctity of life from the moment of conception. The Bible clearly teaches that God not only knows us, but he forms us and even calls us while we're still in our mother's womb. Every child is important, and that's why we work with various organizations to see that babies that are maybe not wanted or expected by their parents, or their parents are incapable of providing and caring for them, are placed in homes where they can and will be loved and cared for. Yet there's many today who claim that such a position denies a woman's right over her own body, and they use their power and position to destroy people who disagree with them. My response to them is that I believe everyone has the right in decision-making over their own body, but rights carry responsibility with them, and once a child is conceived, the responsibility for that life overshadows the right to end an inconvenience. The greatest scourge upon our world right now, the greatest challenge, the greatest death is not coming from this pandemic. The greatest challenge and scourge to life is that 22 million children were aborted around the world in the past year. That is a pandemic. We need to stand up for life. Now, these are all powerful issues that we're remembering today. Jesus said, and he warned us, the thief comes but to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. Today, I want us to discuss a resource that's very powerful, and that has to do with our position in Jesus Christ and the platform that he has given us. Now, those two terms can be used interchangeably, so I want to define them as I am using them today so that we can be on the same page as we walk through this message. Let me define them. I'm using the term position, and when I say position, all of us have some position. You may be a parent, you may be a manager, you may be an owner of something, you you may be on the, the leadership team of some organization in our community. All of us have a position. But my use of this term for this illustration throughout today has to do with using that position as a place of power or influence or of wealth or of control. It's all about me being recognized and me having say over what's going on in my life. That's how I'm using it. It's it's almost a worldly term in that sense. And when I talk about platform, I'm talking about a place of standing that we have that we can make a statement and influence a dialogue out there in our community. I will confess that I have never understood since it came into existence, the whole idea of social media influencers. I have never understood why people can be paid thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to travel around the world, take your picture on the edge of a cliff somewhere, and that influences some brand or something, and you get paid money to do that. I've never understood it. 
but people are given that opportunity. I've never understood it. But people have a platform, and from that platform, they speak into a dialogue in our, in our world. Now, I want to talk about what the difference is between these things, if you stick with me about these various uh, definitions. The first one is this. A position draws attention to us while a platform gives us the space to speak to others. A position draws attention to us. If I have a position, you know, somebody is promoted over top me to get that managerial job, but I feel I deserve that. I deserve that control. I deserve that recognition. That's a position. But a platform gives us the opportunity or space to speak into the lives of others. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever been to London and if you've been to London, whether you ever stop to see Speaker's Corner, it's a fascinating place. Pam and I were there a number of years ago. And people find places or bring things like this or a stool or something, and they get up and they just start talking about something. Now, you notice in the foreground, this man's talking, and he has one guy that's kind of interacting and a few other people that are listening. But if you look at the guy in the red shirt back in about the center of the picture, you'll find that there's a whole crowd around him. Now, I have no idea what they're talking about. When we were there, there was a guy that was preaching the gospel, but he was very condemning of everybody, and I wish I could have replaced him up on his platform because I would have loved to have told people the real gospel. But he was speaking, and not too many people were listening to him, except a few people that wanted to argue with him. But down the way, there was a, a Muslim imam, and he was talking about the, the Islamic, uh, the Muslim religion. Um, and he was talking to the Islam, and he had kind of a crowd around him. And there was somebody down this way that was doing a political speech of some kind. But you can stand up in this marketplace of ideas and just talk about whatever you want. And it all matters whether or not somebody gives you a platform where they give you recognition. And that's the second point I want to make, is that a position can be earned while a platform tends to be given. A position can be earned, but a platform tends to be given. If nobody listened to what they had to say, there was no platform. They're standing there, but they're all by themselves. But there's times when circumstance or people that are responsive to what you're saying, they'll give you a wider platform to listen. When I was in college, my one roommate, David, one of my best friends, still is, he had purchased a new motorcycle and he was riding his motorcycle home from Indiana to Virginia. And he was taking the bike home for the winter. So as he was riding through West Virginia, it was getting later at night, about nine o'clock at night, and I never thought this was possible. I had a motorcycle license and, and rode bikes for years, and I never thought it was possible to do this until it almost happened to me, but it happened to David that night. He's riding along at a pretty good speed on a, a backcountry road into this little village in West Virginia, and he fell asleep riding his bike. And he ran off the road, and he ran smack into the back end of a parked car. And I thought that would be disastrous to somebody. He woke up just as he hit the back of the car. Now, because he's just waking up, he's like a little child. He's still very loose. And so he actually did not get hurt very much, except his one knee went smashing in to the back end of the bumper of the car, and it really messed up his knee. And he's sitting there, and he told me, Jones, I tell you, my, my leg was on fire. I mean, he's just describing this thing to me. And then in, in just normal David, here's what he said. But I realized something. There's this crowd that gathered. And I thought, well, I need to take advantage of this. And so David's sitting there waiting for the ambulance. He can hear the sirens in the background. But this crowd had gathered. And he looked at everybody around him and he said this. He said, folks, I should have died tonight, but I didn't. And I want to tell you why. And he suddenly had a platform for telling this whole crowd of people about Jesus. It's powerful. But see, that was given to him because of his circumstance. Some of us are given platforms just because of a circumstance. The third thing is a position demands while a platform gives. A position demands, but a platform gives. A position demands that you pay attention to me. A position demands that you, you do what I tell you. A position demands that you agree with me or I'll cancel you. Please understand, not all positions. I'm talking about from a world's perspective, that's how 
the world will tend to use positions. But a platform gives. There are many people that have means that they set up Uh, foundations and other things to give to the community around. They're utilizing their position and their wealth in a good way. When people are using their platform to speak into an issue, they're giving information and they're giving people the opportunity to, to dialogue about things so that they can come to a realization of what truth is. Now, if we use those definitions, let me give you some background in the scripture that I think is informative for us. Jesus spoke about this frequently, the difference between a world system and the kingdom system. John put it down in these words in 1 John 2. Don't love the world or anything that's in the world. If anyone loves the world and functions according to that worldly system, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires are going to pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. The world and everything in it, the the evil means of using position for self-glorification and and exercise of power over people, that's all going to pass away. In fact, Psalm 103 puts it this way. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone and the place remembers it no more. Those kinds of things that irritate and I think have many people stirred up in their their spirit today. There's a lot of anger. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of frustration. But we got to remember that these kinds of things, the things that are imposing themselves upon us, are going to pass away. But for those of us that are in Jesus Christ, Psalm 112 declares this, Surely the righteous will never be shaken. They will be remembered forever. God will never forget you. He will remember you forever. They will have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Their hearts are secure. They will have no fear. In the end, they will look in triumph on their foes. Hallelujah. We can be secure in Jesus Christ. You see, God has turned everything upside down. Think about it. When we are persecuted, we bless. When we are mistreated, we forgive. Instead of seeking to have people serve us, we serve. We are like Jesus Christ in the world. And God has said, if you're willing to follow me, that kind of response to a world system will give you a platform by which you can speak into their lives. Think about this, beloved. Right now, our position is this. According to the scriptures, those of us that are in Christ Jesus, we are seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven with Jesus Christ in the heavenlies. That's our position. And no matter what our earthly position is, we are free now to use that as a platform of influence to speak and have discussions with people in the world. I am grateful for the influence that God gives us and the platform that he gives us. So I entitled this message, A Growing Voice. It may be that you are so frustrated today with the things that are happening in the world. It it may be that that the isolation has done something to us, but this rancor that has happened in our political system has caused something. I just want to talk how we can utilize what God has given us for his glory. And we can have a growing voice. And if you've been a little bit hesitant about that, I just want to encourage us today to use our voices for the glory of God. To do that, I want to use the life of a man that you may have heard of before. It's in John chapter 3. It's where we see him first. His name is Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was a religious leader, a teacher. In fact, Jesus called him Israel's teacher. We find that in his life, he was a part of the Sanhedrin. This was a Jewish ruling council that they made declarations about whether people were truly following the law of God or weren't following the law of God. By nature, their position was such that he would have been married Somebody asked me if I knew much about his wife or anything. I don't, but if you watch The Chosen, you can give an idea of what they think she was like. 
It's a, it's a good series. I encourage you to watch it. But we find that he had wealth, he had position, he was recognized. People sought his view on things. And yet we find that he had questions stirring up in his soul. Maybe you have questions stirring up in your soul. God is moving you to question the foundation of what you believe. And that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. And to begin this movement of going from just having a worldly position kind of view to having a platform, the first point I would just point out to you in his life is this. Movement begins with humility and questions. It begins with humility and questions. We find as Nicodemus is stirred by hearing what Jesus had to say, he came to him one night. Look at verse 2. And he came to Jesus at night for fear of, of what his friends might say. He might lose his position amongst his friends. And he says, Rabbi, which means teacher, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the signs you're doing if God were not with him. He didn't even know what question to ask. He just knew there was something stirring in his soul that was, was perked by what this young rabbi was saying. And Jesus said to him, Very, verily, truly, I say, I'll tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. Now, how can someone be born when they're old, Nicodemus asked. Surely one cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. And Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at me saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases, and you hear its sound, but you can't tell from where it comes from and where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus just responds, but how, how can this be? And he says to him, you're Israel's teacher, and you don't get it? It's my translation. Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we've seen, but still you people don't accept our testimony. I've spoken to you of earthly things, and, and you don't believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses was lifted up, lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone that believes in him will have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, Nicodemus, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him would be saved. He's having a dialogue with the questions that Nicodemus has. Nicodemus is solely thinking on a physical, metaphysical kind of level. And Jesus said, Nicodemus, I don't understand. If you look into your own scriptures, into the law, if you go back to the prophets, it was clear in the prophets, the illusion that Jesus is using about being born of water and the Spirit. A lot of people have tried to say, well, that must be about baptism or something. It has nothing to do with that. There's an illusion that is taken back to the prophets that just indicates water comes from God, Spirit comes from God. It was God that put Spirit in man. And it's just saying to have a true transformation, it has to be a work of God inside us. It is not a physical thing of going back into your mama's womb. It is a spiritual transformation and new birth that makes us a new creature in Jesus Christ from the inside out. And you don't get this. You're Israel's teacher and you don't get it. But he says, the wind blows. And, and you see the effects of it. And see, if you're at that point today where you have questions about what it means to truly be in relationship with God then by all means, beloved, I encourage you, if you're in the room, have a conversation with somebody over at Hospitality afterwards, or if you're watching in line, put your questions in the chat or go to ehwc.org slash my moment and let's dialogue about the questions because questions are good unless you're just asking questions to be belligerent. <laughs> That's no good for anybody. But if you have honest questions about I just don't get it, just like Nicodemus doesn't get it, then please help us to get in dialogue with you about those questions because that is the beginning point. Humility that leads to questions. Because as that begins, then Nicodemus starts a journey. Jesus addressed his questions and they interact about them. And that leads to the second step for Nicodemus. If you turn with me over to chapter 7, we find that Nicodemus is back in 
in the Sanhedrin. And, and they're trying to do something that is very evident and reflected in our world today. They're in a session, and they don't like what Jesus is doing, and they don't like how people are following him. They are, they are taking a position to try to destroy Jesus. And in the midst of all that is Nicodemus. In fact, they sent the guard out to arrest Jesus and bring him before them. Look at verse 45 of chapter 7. Finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests after listening to what Jesus had to say and the Pharisees, and they, they asked the, the Pharisees asked them, why didn't you bring him in? No one ever spoke the way this man does, the guards replied. They were so taken up by what Jesus had to say, they failed to bring him along. You mean he deceived you also, the Pharisees retorted? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? No, but the mob that knows nothing of the law, there's a curse on them. And here we have Nicodemus, verse 50. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number, asked, does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he's been doing? They replied, are you from Galilee too? Look into it. You'll find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. The second point I want to make for you is just this. This movement will continue by courage and posing questions. Nicodemus had gotten to a point where he had the courage within the framework of his friends to start asking questions that address their presuppositions. The law, the Mosaic law that they supposedly were functioning under, did not allow for a man to just be destroyed or to be condemned without first investigating. It's somewhat like an impeachment that's happening in our nation's capital right now. There's just a declaration of guilt. There's no investigation. There's no looking at it. And that violates, no matter what side of the political spectrum, that's just wrong. I don't care who it is. It's just wrong when processes are violated. And Nicodemus, among his friends right now, are, are saying this. This man's condemned, so let's go after him. And Nicodemus says, but... Does our law truly allow for that to take place without first investigating? He's addressing their presuppositions. Let me say this. For us as believers, many people think you've got to get into heated conversations and debates with people to try to convince them about the rightness of Jesus Christ. And I just want to say to you, the powerful tool, the platform that God has given us is not one of, of debate where we just go at people. It's about planting a seed, a question about having them face their own presuppositions about things. And God, the Holy Spirit, is the one that is given the right to convince people and convict people. We are given the opportunity to plant a seed of truth into their life. And just like a seed that's planted in a little bit of dirt in a crack in concrete can eventually grow up and break down concrete, so God will use that seed to be planted into their life so that they can have to face up and decide what is true and what is not true. So for us, Again, if you're at a point where you're solid in the relationship with Jesus, but you've never used your voice, don't think that you have to know everything. Just ask people questions that, that challenge their presuppositions, and God will use that. He's given you a platform to do that. And it may be the same questions that you've asked. The third thing is this. This movement will end eventually in an investment and service. Look with me at chapter 19 of John. Nicodemus comes from asking his own questions and humbly comes and gets those questions answered. It moves him to a point where amongst his friends, he starts asking questions of them to, to challenge their presuppositions. And then we, kind, we see this. This, this is the, the movement that happens, verse 38 of chapter 19. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was also somebody was standing, somebody in a position, and, and he was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body. Now, he was accompanied 
by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. And Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. And taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. And at the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. In the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Here's Nicodemus joining with another secret saint by the name of Joseph. And they took Jesus' body, and he makes a fairly hefty investment in caring for Jesus. This puts him out in the open now. And he does this service to Jesus to make sure he's buried in according with tradition and, and custom. And, and, and so he's outed, if you would. But he did that because God had given him a voice. And this voice was growing. And his courage to be able to stand for Jesus was overwhelming enough that he, he said, I can be out in the open now. It's okay. Now, if you look at the extra biblical sources to find out what happened to Nicodemus left after this, uh, after he left this position, after, after he was done with this act of service, because people would have publicly seen him do this, what happened to him later? Well, we don't have any really great sources about it, but the sources that are there say this, that because of this, and he was outed, he was stripped of his position in the Sanhedrin. He was thrown out as a teacher. They took away his money. They took away his home. He and his family were run out of town, out of Jerusalem. It tells us in these traditions that he ended up in the home of Gamaliel, who was maybe a familiar name to you. Paul studied at his feet, this teacher of the law, who also became a follower of Jesus. And he then took him in, and when Nicodemus finally died, he buried him in the tomb beside the first Christian martyr, a guy by the name of Stephen. You see, his voice continued to speak even after this, even though he was stripped of other things. Beloved, listen. Big tech can try to cancel the voices of conservatism and, and truth as we put scripture out there. I'm not talking about radical stuff. I'm just talking about it seems that there's a lot of cancellation, a lot of things, but nobody can cancel your voice in the framework of relationships that you have with people. And today, our voice is needed more than ever to stand up for the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. People need to be freed from all this stuff that's going on all around. They need to walk out of darkness into light, out of death into life. And so our voices are needed more than ever. And so from a worldly point of view, Nicodemus lost it all. But from a heavenly point of view, he has rich rewards and glory. All of this is going to pass away. But the truth of God's word will never pass away. So that's why we are secure and our hearts should never fear bad things. Because God has given us a platform to speak for him. So the question I have in application for us is this. Where is God starting to move you from just having a position that you want to be secure in, a position that you want to have control over, that you want to use to bring things toward you? Where is he moving you from that to using that position as a platform to raise your voice for him? What's your next step? We see Nicodemus step by step by step moving in this, and his voice was strong for Jesus Christ. And they continue to grow those platforms God has given us. We will need to have resources, the resources of support from one another, the resources of putting time and energy into this. And it may be that we need resources that will help us to speak this into other places, and that's what our Commitment Sunday will be like in a couple weeks when we'll talk about how God is going to put us in a place of financial freedom so so much can be invested in the kingdom. It's exciting for me to think about. But I do know this. Every one of us, every one of us has been given a platform by God that will never be taken away. And we are to use it to plant those seeds into the lives of other people 
so that his kingdom and his glory can spread throughout all the earth. Are we using our platforms for that? That's the question I want us to wrestle with today. You know, Father, as we finish out our time here and as we look to you, I just thank you. You are all that we need. Nicodemus understood that. And once he got straight what this is about being born again, being born from above, having you transform our life, once he got that question answered, then it became evident the next steps he needed to take. And I pray that it will be evident for all of us today. I thank you that we are not helpless victims in our world. We are mighty warriors for the kingdom of our God. And you have given us a platform to speak to people Help us to engage in the marketplace of ideas and share truth, truth that will free people from the bonds that so keep them bound and chained so that they truly might find freedom in Jesus Christ and then join their voice with ours in lifting up our Savior and seeing you transform life after life after life until you come again or until you call us home. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm caught up in your presence And I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this hole Never want to leave Oh, I'm not here for blessings No Cause Jesus, you don't owe me anything And more than anything that you can do I just want and I'm sorry when I've just gone through the motions I'm sorry when I just sang another song take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you And I'm sorry When I've come with my agenda I'm sorry When I forgot that you're enough Take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you Let's get caught up in his presence Caught up in your prayer this your prayer and I'm sorry when I've just gone through the motions I'm sorry when I just sang another song take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you start us over father And I'm sorry When I've come with my agenda I'm sorry 
And I forgot that you're enough Take me back to where we started And I open up my heart to you I'm caught up in your presence And I just want to sing holy moment and I never want to leave have your way have your way in us oh I'm not here for blessing no Jesus you don't owe me anything and more You know, if we live our life just saying, Lord, I just need you. My friend George Mueller, again, he said this. When he prayed and got his heart right before God, when he was on that journey, he would pray and he'd trust God and then he'd watch for the answer. More than any time in history, our voices are needed this day. We can't afford to be silent. We need to be looking and saying, okay, God, open my eyes to the platforms you've given me, to the places where my voice can be added to the dialogue, to the marketplace of ideas, where I can point people to you and help me to have the courage to step out and do that. You know, right after the service is done, if you have questions, again, check in at the hospitality room or online, go to ehwc.org slash my moment, and we'd love to dialogue with you about that. Also, immediately after this service upstairs, there's going to be a, a class that has to do with uh, estate planning. And you know, one of the last ways that we can give a witness is when we die, our will includes the things of God in, in the giving of our last resources here. So if you have any interest in that or help questions about that, there'll be somebody available that would be glad to have you in that class and answer any questions you have. Father, I just thank you that you have given us this platform. Much like the, the parable that you told Jesus, there are some people that are using their positions and they're building their life on sand and it's going to get washed away. But I thank you that today we're building on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. And because of that, we will be able to stand forever, not because of the things that we have done, but because of what you have done. And you just want to use us as voices to speak your truth into the lives of people. May we go forth and do that in the power of your spirit, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're just going to continue to sing a little bit longer. The bridge of this song, I just want you, nothing else. just want you and nothing else and nothing else nothing else will do I just want you and nothing else oh nothing else nothing else will do I just want Nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you, and nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. And I 
satisfies Ooh, We like to think that it does We chase after so many things Strip it away Oh, strip it all away 